Welcome to our presentation about corrosion and corrosion treatment. We will start with a short definition and a description of the different types of corrosion. Then we will have a look on the risk of corrosion and the material selection. Finally, we will see the corrosion tests done by Dockweiler. Here you see the definition. Corrosion is defined according to a DIN standard, DIN EN ISO 8044. Corrosion is a physiochemical interaction between a metal and its environment, which results in changes in the properties of the metal and which may often lead to impairment of the function of the metal, the environment or the whole technical system of which these form a part. And I think everyone knows this. Another important thing we have to keep in mind is the definition of stainless steel. Stainless steels are iron alloys with at least 11% chromium content and they derive their corrosion resistance from a thin invisible surface layer which forms spontaneously with the chromium atoms near the surface and oxygen present in the environment. This layer is also called passive layer and it drastically reduces the corrosion rate of our stainless steels. There are, however, environments which cause permanent breakdown of the passive layer. Under circumstances where the passive layer cannot rebuild, corrosion occurs on the unprotected surface. There are different types of corrosion that are important for us. One is the uniform corrosion when the whole passive layer, or at least a large section of it, is destroyed, and it causes a more or less uniform corrosion on the whole surface. A lot of metal ions are removed from the surface. This occurs mainly in acids or hot alkaline solutions. The following five localized corrosion types are very important for us. The first one is pitting corrosion when only a local breakdown of the passive layer occurs. In most cases, this is caused by solutions containing chloride with high chloride content. And there we find small holes on the surface. You can clearly see them by naked eye inspection after removing the corrosion products off the surface. The second one is crevice corrosion, also happens in neutral and acid chloride solutions. The attack starts more easily in narrow crevices, easier than on unshielded surfaces. So, everywhere where you have a flange joint or something else, this could happen in chloride-containing solutions. Stress corrosion cracking is a combined effect of tensile stress and a corrosive environment. It is again like pitting corrosion and crevice corrosion caused by solutions containing chloride. Intergranular corrosion could also happen in stainless steels, although they are high alloyed. It is a preferential corrosion of the grain boundaries and it might occur due to chromium carbide or intermetallic phases in the surface area. And the last form of localized corrosion interesting for us is galvanic corrosion. Every metal has a defined corrosion performance. When you bring two dissimilar materials electrically into contact, this differs from the performance of only one metal. Immersed in a conductive liquid and electrolyte, their corrosion performance might differ significantly when compared with the uncoupled metals. As a rule of thumb, you can say that the less noble material will corrode by contact of different metals with each other. One thing that also happens very often in stainless steel is rouging in pure water or clean steam systems. There are two types of rouging, one more red-brown layer you can easily wipe away and a black one that cannot be removed easily. In most cases you can't see this effect at the place on the part where it is caused. You see it somewhere at the end, at an end cap or a vessel for example. So the rouging product is transported through the whole system and afterwards you see it somewhere, but the reason for it, not the incorrect part, could be everywhere in the system. Now we know all corrosion types which are important for us. Different media can cause different types of corrosion attack that may vary in nature and appearance and several forms of corrosion can occur in stainless steel. Now we have to ask how we can prevent all our stainless steels from corroding. 
or how do we know in which environment we have to use which alloy? Therefore, one very easy table shows the chloride content and the temperature. The risk of chloride-induced pitting corrosion can be minimized by increasing the molybdenum and nickel content in stainless steel. You can also clearly see it in the table. When we have 1.4301 and add molybdenum, then you have 1.4401. It has higher chloride content and a higher temperature before pitting corrosion starts. If you then increase the molybdenum and nickel content, here in the region of 1.4435, it results in a higher temperature and higher chloride content before pitting-induced corrosion starts. But this table is only for a defined chloride content range up to 100 degrees Celsius. So what happens in other environments, and how can we find the information we need for our customers? There are different solutions. The first thing is that you know it's due to empirical data, or you know someone in the company who has the experience, like, for example, Dr. Yan Rao. So, where else can we look? One thing is the Autokumpu Stainless Corrosion Handbook, formerly Avesta Sheffield Corrosion Handbook. There, you will find nearly every basic information, the definition of the different corrosion types, and also tables of different media of different composition, concentrations and temperatures, with 17 stainless steel and nickel alloys, where you can see which alloy is corrosion resistant. The Euro Enox is the European Stainless Steel Development Association. This is an online library, where you can find everything about the properties of stainless steel and its application. The Nickel Institute is the same for nickel. It's a global association of the world's primary nickel producers, most of them outside of China. There is a lot of information you need to know about nickel and nickel alloys. But, therefore, you have to have time to look, to search for your information, so, in most cases of daily business, we need something faster. One very fast method is to calculate the pitting resistance equivalent number. It is a measure of the relative pitting corrosion resistance of stainless steel in an environment containing chloride. A common factor of the new steels is a high content of the alloying elements chromium, molybdenum, and in most cases, nitrogen. Attempts have been made to establish a measure of the pitting and crevice corrosion resistance while calculating the sum of the most important alloying elements in a weighed form. You only need the concentration of the elements according to the 3.1 certificate. You put the numbers into the equation and then you can calculate the number for stainless steels or for nickel-based alloys. As a rule of thumb, everything above 33 is deemed seawater proof. As an example, S31603 has a number equal or greater than 23. This is very easy, but you have to keep in mind that PRE expressions are based on accelerated laboratory tests performed on perfectly heat-treated base material. No cold working is in between, there is no weld or anything else in your material, and in reality there is always something at the end, a weld seam or grinding, and then your numbers decrease by these manufacturing steps. This you have to keep in mind. So this is very easy, and you have one number in the end. Sometimes this would help, but we also need something we can test, because when you calculate only the number and then work in the daily business and corrosion occurs, you have to find the defect or what happens in your production steps. Therefore, there are indirect and direct test methods. To get knowledge about your batch, the corrosion behavior of one defined batch or the influence of production steps. The indirect test methods are complicated. You need an electron microscope and then you can determine, as an example, the chromium to iron ratio using XPS ESCA according to semi-F60 or the depth of the chromium oxide enriched passive layer by AES according to semi-F72. This needs time. You need the person with an electron microscope and for us this means a third party inspection. One sample costs around 1000 euros. This is very expensive and is also time-consuming. Then there are tests which are easier to perform. These are direct test methods. 
One very easy test is the exposure test according to ASTM G31 for general corrosion. You take a sample, put it somewhere outside, wait one, three or five years, then you look again on your sample and you can say in this environment it is corrosion resistant or not. The salt spray test according to ASTM B117 or ISO 9227 for pitting corrosion is another direct test method. One procedure where you get one number that is not as time consuming as the indirect test method is to determine the critical potential of the critical pitting temperature CPT according to ASTM G150 and the determination of the critical pitting potential CPP according to ASTM G61. The determination of the critical pitting potential by cyclic polarization, according to ASTM G61, is a corrosion test done at Dockweiler. Based on the principle of an electrochemical cell in a current potential curve is recorded in potentiodynamic measurements, showing the electrochemical behavior of a corrosion system. An indication of the susceptibility to initiation of localized corrosion is given by the potential at which the anodic current increases rapidly. The more noble this potential obtained at a fixed scan rate, the less susceptible the alloy is to initiation of local corrosion. In general, once initiated, localized corrosion can propagate at the potential at which the hysteresis curve is closed. This is done with a sample we cut from a tube, so we need nothing flat. This is something characteristical for Dockweiler. Everything is bent in one or two directions. We have a masking of our specimen, so we always measure only one square centimeter, and we have a definite electrolyte in our corrosion cell. This is 3.56 weight percent of sodium chloride, so it corresponds to the concentration of seawater. It is temperature controlled and then we can start to prepare the measurements. So, we first prepare our sample. The curved design of the tube samples renders all common specimen holders unsuitable, as these are designed for flat samples only. Therefore, the surface of the test specimen is masked with a gamry porthole. The remaining surface is entirely covered by adhesive tape, and the tip of the specimen is sealed with liquid paraffin to prevent any contact with the electrolyte. Test specimen cut from tubes necessitates a special mount in which curved samples of different diameters can be fixed. In the next step, we purge the electrolyte with nitrogen for at least one hour in order to remove oxygen and carbon dioxide to get a defined measurement. First step of the measurement is to measure the non-operative potential OCP, that is, open circuit potential. Next step is the initiating of the potential scan beginning at the OCP in the more noble, that is, positive direction, at a scan rate of 0.6 volts per hour, that's 5%, recording of electric current. The onset of localized corrosion is marked by a rapid increase of the anodic current to 1 to 5 milliamps. The polarization scan is reversed until completion of the hysteresis loop closes or until the original OCP is reached. The figure shows the polarization diagram of the outer surface of a seamless tube, cold redrawn, annealed and mechanically polished, material 1.4571 UNS 31635. At a potential of 422 millivolts, the current potential curve rises drastically, showing the critical pitting potential. The peaks appearing on the current scale shortly before the pitting potential indicates corrosion attacks, which repassivate immediately. With this test, we have, after one day, one defined number where we can see is our stainless steel really as good as we expected. And we can compare this data with data worldwide because it is according to a standard. The figure shows the polarization diagram of a seamless metallic bright finished tube and electro-polished ID surface of a welded tube. If surfaces are electro-polished, we all know the corrosion characteristics of the surface improve amongst others. The influence of electro-polishing a surface you can see in this diagram. 
The typical value is 400 millivolts for metallic bright surfaces, and when we electro-polish them, we always measure a CPP value of around 1000 millivolts and better. The effect on the CPP value, respectively the corrosion behaviour, when you pickle or anodically clean, would be in between. So when you pickle, the CPP value is around 500 millivolts, and when you anodically clean, the value is around 800 millivolts. We are taking two measurements per sample to avoid influences due to single surface defects or incorrect sample preparation. So we can compare our data. Therefore, this test is time consuming. This test we are only doing for qualification of new production steps, for internal complaints about, for example, different surface appearances after electro polishing or when we receive a customer complaint. It is not a standard procedure in our incoming inspection. The inner surface of welded tubes, 76.2 times 1.65 mm, 1.4307 UNS S30403, appears dull and grey after electro polishing, indicating a surface defect. The CPP of the mechanically polished ID surface was found to be below the value expected for material 1.4307 UNS S30403. Based on this, a reduction of wall thickness of 10 micrometers was attempted in an initial treatment of electro-polishing. Subsequent CPP measurement showed a significant improvement, but the removal of 10 micrometers was not sufficient to reconstitute the CPP to the characteristic level for the respective steel grade. By further electro-polishing up to a total removal of 20 micrometers, the CPP measurements showed results above 400 millivolts. The characteristic level for 1.4307 UNS S30403. Further investigation revealed the following potential root cause for the reduced resistance to chloride induced pitting in the as delivered condition. Carbonization of the surface due to burnt in residues of lubricants during annealing. Carbonization of the surface due to worn out abrasives in connection with an overheated surface. You can clearly see the red one stands for the as-delivered condition. Also, for 304L, 250 millivolts is a very bad value, and it is only increased by electro-polishing of the surface. In the end, after the electro-polishing, we are in an acceptable region. Normally, the value for 304L electro-polished is also better than 400 millivolts. So we know that there is something in the surface and in the end we could find that there was an oil or something else from the grinding and the production that was not fully removed before the heat treatment. During the heat treatment the carbon from the surface diffused into the material. This was the reason for this corrosion behaviour. You already heard before, this CPP measurement needs two days to get a result for one sample. This also is time consuming and the question is, is there something faster? To get a first impression of a surface and the corrosion behaviour without destroying something or cutting something, the Coro pad can be used. It is a test pad with an indicator solution containing an activator and by means of a binding agent it is kept in a gel-like condition. It simulates a moisture film at the surface of the test object and maintains a defined corrosion system. At areas with disturbed passive layer, the passage of iron ions is indicated by a colour change to blue. So you clearly see on the blue spots in the coro pad that there are holes in the passive layer on the surface. This is a very fast test method. After cleaning the surface, testing time is 15 minutes. Comparable results are achieved in the temperature range of plus 15 to plus 30 degrees Celsius. This method is a non-destructive test you can also do at a customer's site. The Coro pad is suitable for comparative examination of the corrosion resistance of stainless steel surfaces. It mainly is a surface-specific test method and thus it is suitable for all stainless steels with a PRE greater than 18. This is the pre-step we are doing before we start the time-consuming CPP measurements. It is a very fast method to get a first impression of the corrosion behaviour of a surface.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention.